A few weeks ago, I watched this movie, Spore Loose. The American title is The Vanishing. And today I'm going to try and answer this question. Why did I like this movie so much? Why did I find it so effective? Why is this movie so good? What makes this movie so good? Introduction, Introduction of, of sorts. sorts. Spore Loose was released in 1988 and was directed by George Slyzer, a Dutch filmmaker. In 1993, Slyzer would be hired to remake his own film for American audiences, The Vanishing. Going forward, I will refer to the year to identify which film I'm discussing. So 88 was the original and 93 was the American version. Hollywood loves taking successful foreign films and making them again, but in English. No subtitles, no dubbing, purely American. I think most people are resistant to support these remakes because it's a bastardization of something that already worked so well. I should note success is usually in terms of box office. Hollywood doesn't like to gamble, so they're going to remake something that was already a proven hit. One such example of a foreign film that was transformed for American viewers, Girl with a Dragon Tattoo in 2009, was uh, Swedish and directed by Niels Arden Oplev. And then in 2011, David Fincher came out and put his spin on the book and released Girl with a Dragon Tattoo 2011 version. I need your help. You come stay on the island. A way of avoiding all those people you might want to avoid right now. You will be investigating thieves, misers, bullies, the most detestable collection of people that you will ever meet. My family. Another example that happens to be Swedish is in 2008, Let the Right One In, directed by Thomas Alfredsson. Then in 2010, Matt Reeves directed Let Me In. There was an incident last night. One of your recent graduates here was killed. I live next door to you. What happened there? Some kids from school. I'll help you. But you're a girl. I'm a lot stronger than you think I am. Funnily enough, both of these remakes were not huge successes financially. Technically, the Girl with a Dragon Tattoo remake was considered to have underperformed. The rule of thumb is a movie needs to make two and a half times or three times the budget to actually be profitable and to have made money. Then there are the rare examples of filmmakers who make a movie in their home country and then are brought in to remake it in English. For example, Michael Haneke with Funny Games. In 1997, he released that film in Austria. And then 10 years later in 2007, there was the American version of Funny Games, which was also directed by Michael Haneke. What is it, honey? There's someone here. Hello. Sorry to disturb you. I'm staying next door. I did read online that many compare the themes and style of the original Vanishing to that of Haneke's work. This video is not about the original Dutch version being superior. At least that's not the main point. We can agree or disagree on which version is better. I'm more interested in discussing why this movie is so effective. To be clear, I am a fan. I'd heard for years that this movie was great. I finally got around to seeing it and it really knocked my socks off. I couldn't stop thinking about it. Plot, Plot summary. summary. In a perfect world, you've seen this movie. If you've been meaning to, turn my video off and go see it. Ideally, you come back to this video, fingers crossed. <laughs> this movie opens with a Dutch couple, Rex and Saskia, on vacation in France. It's important that they are strangers in this land. 
Maybe you're thinking those two places aren't that far from each other. Google tells me it's under a four hour train ride. However, being in this new environment on a holiday is important to the story. Rex and Saskia are bickering, as is bound to happen when traveling. I personally am a nightmare to travel with if you are my significant other. What do you? I look at the benzinometer. Look at the Maria Spiegel. Saskia tells Rex about. My night, Mary. Van nacht heb ik het weer gedroomd. Van het gouden ei. Dat hij opgesloten zat in het gouden ei en niet uit kon en eeuwig alleen door de rente viel. But this time it was different. Nee. Er vloog nog een gouden ei door de ruimte. They run out of gas after Saskia had told Rex to get gas. So that's a frustrating experience. <laughs> ik ben bang. So there's this tension. He ends up leaving her with the car, even though she begs him not to. And Rex sets off on foot to go get gas. As a viewer, you're thinking, oh God, is this how it happens? Because maybe like me, you knew the premise of the film is that Saskia goes missing and Rex is haunted by that and tries to find her. But it's a misdirect because the next day he returns to the car with the gas and she's not there. He does find her though. And it's this beautiful poetic moment of driving through a dark tunnel and she's in this bright heavenly daylight. The next day, the couple stops at a gas station. And what is the first shot we see in this scene? This goateed motherfucker putting on a fake cast. A very unsettling act. Slicer doesn't hide his face. I think the boring traditional way to introduce the villain would be to kind of obscure his face. We don't know what he looks like for most of the movie. But Slicer does the opposite. We see his face and it feels radical because what is scarier than man himself? Nothing. We know this is the bad guy of the story. We know he will be successful in taking Saskia. All we can hope for is Rex is able to get her back. A Hollywood ending would be he rescues her. Like their love brings him back to her to save her. Or maybe she saves herself, but all because of the strength of their love. <laughs> it's devastating when Rex figures out Saskia is gone. You want to shake the guy and say, call the damn cops. But it's the late 80s, people were more trusting and slower to respond. Saskia has been snatched. And at around 25 minutes in, we enter Act 2. This act opens with the bad guy, Raymond. I was gobsmacked. Is it God smacked or gobsmacked? I was gobsmacked. Somehow, I never heard this movie follows the villain, that we're seeing the villain's point of view. Once again, this decision to tell the story this way is brilliant. He is not a boogeyman in the shadows. He's a family man that we can assume takes pleasure in doing bad, horrible, terrible things. He is methodical. I think the screaming scene with Raymond and his family is a master class in building tension. How the pieces are given to us when we put together what Raymond is doing, which is testing this house he just bought to see if it's a good place to bring his victims. It is disturbing. Raymond tests the effectiveness of chloroform. At first, I was unsure if we're seeing the actions that led to Saskia's abduction or if Raymond has already taken Saskia and he's trying to perfect his next crime, his next abduction. 
This uncertainty forces you to be an active viewer. You're trying to decipher timelines. I did come to understand that Raymond's preparations, the buying of the house in the country, testing the chloroform, that all of this occurred before Saskia. Raymond times how long it would take to get a woman in his car and make her unconscious and unable to fight back. Quelle coïncidence, quelle coïncidence. Vous pourriez aussi bien monter dans ma voiture. The very next scene is him picking up his daughter from school. Just the way he leads her to the car, his hand on the crook of her neck, it's enough to make you uneasy. And it's because it looks familial, chivalrous even. But he's in control. He's guiding her. She can't really get away from him. We know he has ulterior motives. Pourquoi t'as fait ça? Ben parce que je t'aime bien. Tiens. But he can rationalize it so well and so quickly. That's the true horror. And not only could he rationalize it, but the victim, his daughter, we can imagine being in her position and how you would rationalize it to yourself. Like, this is your dad. Maybe it's a little bit uncomfortable, but he's not trying to harm you. You, would, you wouldn't think that. 40 minutes in, three years have passed. We see the passage of time because Raymond has baby bangs now. We're now with Rex. He has a new girlfriend who is you know, very beautiful, <laughs> uh, but he's haunted by Saskia's disappearance. Soms fantaseer ik dat ze nog leeft. Ergens ver weg, ze is heel gelukkig en zo. En dan moet ik kiezen. Of ik kan haar zo door laten leven. Maar dan kom ik niks te weten. Of als ik haar laat doodgaan, kom ik alles te weten. Which is a really heartbreaking sentiment. What What is better, the truth, to know the truth, or to live in a fantasy, in denial? He's been getting these postcards from Saskia's killer. They're toying with him, asking him to come meet, and then never showing up. I have to send my brief card to you in your hand. I find it nice. Thank you. Let's see. Raymond gets a lot of excitement from toying with Rex because nobody knows what he did. So it's a way to keep reliving that pleasure from holding the power in the situation. Rex goes on a news show to speak directly to the killer. Je veux vous rencontrer. And coax him into a meeting. Et pas. La foudre non plus. Je ne la ai pas. Monsieur Hoffman. Je suis que vous the midpoint, it's bananas. We've been conditioned by the Hollywood system to think you can't do this. What Slizer does here, it's wild. Raymond approaches Rex in person, chess out there, no disguise, no nothing. Elle est mort. Morte. Venez avec moi en France et vous saurez tout. Rex delivers a smackdown. Good for him. And this whole scene, brilliant. Rex is broken. What do you say to your partner's killer? You have all these ideas of what you'd say, what you'd do if you came face to face with that person, but he wants the truth so desperately that that's what's leading him. Vous pouvez me tuer. Je vous en reconnais le droit. J'en prends le risque. Et je spécule sur votre curiosité. Vous voulez savoir ce qui est arrivé à Mademoiselle Saskia? À l'âge de 16 ans, j'ai fait une découverte. This is when Raymond reveals why he is how he is. Ce genre de pensée, tout le monde en a, mais personne ne saute jamais. Comment peut-il être déjà écrit que je ne sauterai pas? Sociopath. Vous pouvez me trouver dans les encyclopédies médicales, en tant que sociopath dans les nouvelles éditions. Vous avez violé Saskia. His response here. Once again, we're not given a clear answer. It's up to your interpretation. Oui, bon, Monsieur Hoffman. And that's what keeps our interest. Either it's an obvious yes, or Raymond brushes it off because the accusation of that act is beneath him. Like, that's not why he did this. Et comme le noir n'existe pas sans le blanc, je me suis logiquement représenté la chose la plus horrible 
que je pouvais imaginer à ce moment-là. Je m'empresse de vous dire que pour moi le pire, ce n'est pas tuer. Raymond celebrates his birthday with his family, and it seems, you know, very sweet, even though we know <laughs> what Raymond is. But he comes to the realization that to get a woman in his car, he needs to. Mais ça, c'est quand t'es tombé du balcon. And that's how the broken arm was born. C'est moi qui devais être plus faible. We all recognize why this is so twisted. To weaponize someone's humanity so you can harm them might be the worst thing a person can do. It's the day of Saskia's abduction. Raymond spots her. He picks her. But because of fate, she manages to avoid him. He gets another woman into his car, but he doesn't go through with it. Le destin, Monsieur Hoffman. Si je n'avais pas éternué. Saskia approaches Raymond for change. Our expectation, how it's been set up, is that Raymond has put so much time and effort and practice into his plan. Yet in the end, it's destiny that leads to Saskia's abduction. Oh, you regard moi. Ça va être mal. C'est très joli, hein? She comments on his keychain, the one his daughter gave him for his birthday. So he pivots his plan. Je suis représentant de ces choses. Je les vends. J'en ai plein dans ma voiture. Ici? Pardon? Montez! She almost doesn't get in the car, but the sight of his family photo convinces her. Once again, this belief that a family man can't, shouldn't, be a monster. He subdues her and that's that. Raymond and Rex are pulled over by a cop because Raymond isn't wearing a seatbelt. He has a doctor's note because he's claustrophobic. Oui, ce que je disais. When I first saw this scene, I thought it was to kind of torture us, like, oh, the police were so close to intervening or figuring out something was wrong. But it doesn't go that way. It it follows up in a different direction. Monsieur Hoffman. Raymond pours Rex some coffee. La seule façon de vous le raconter, c'est de vous faire vivre exactement ce qu'elle a vécu. Vous êtes complètement fou. Raymond tells him that he's put a sleeping pill in the drink. We'd expect him to not outright share this information because we're always told, show, don't tell. This is not suspense. This is not how we've been trained to expect suspense. But there's an understanding between these men. Rex wants to know what happened, but he's also suffocated by his own guilt. He feels so guilty that maybe he wants to experience everything Saskia did because then he will know and then he will have peace. And maybe because he's been punishing himself this whole time, he's not allowing himself to move on, that this final act of punishment is what he feels he deserves. J'en sais assez. Le reste, je m'en fous. Je m'en vais. Et l'incertitude Cette éternelle incertitude, Monsieur Hoffman And I think this is the key to the whole movie. It's the realization that he will never stop wondering. Ce qu'il est écrit. Il faut voir. Cut to Raymond digging. This fucker buried Rex alive, which is a terrible way to go. Someone on Reddit made the great observation, we know Raymond has claustrophobia, so bad that he has a doctor's note so he doesn't have to wear a seatbelt. To him, being buried alive is the worst way to die. And we can assume that that is how he killed Saskia as well. As Rex dies, he sees the image of Saskia on the other end of the tunnel, which harkens back to Saskia's dream about the two eggs finding each other in space. Ugh, it is devastating. The final shot is Raymond watching his wife water the front garden. We understand Rex and Saskia are buried there. Then the camera floats over to a newspaper in the trunk, which states Rex has gone missing just like Saskia. And the photos are oval shaped. One could even say egg shaped. Cue the credits. Whoo. I started this video trying to answer the question, why did I find this movie so effective? 
now that I've given you an in-depth plot summary, you get it. And that's the end of my video. <laughs> okay, let me talk, let me talk a bit more. What makes this movie so powerful is that it's unexpected and restrained. Also thematically, it's saying something universal and thought provoking, which is, you know, ideally what a theme does in the story. The restrained. And unexpected. I was pleasantly surprised, which is another way to say it was unexpected, how the film portrayed violence. We only really see one physical act of violence because that's all Slicer felt that we needed. There's this idea that Americans show violence and blood a lot while being more prudish, more reserved with nudity and sex. This movie is a prime example that you don't need a ton of physical violence on screen to have an effect on the viewer. I already mentioned this earlier, but the choice to show the villain's perspective, I think is the movie's greatest strength. Historically, it's not a common thing to do in movies to show the villain's perspective. Raymond outright states what he did, yet we know we can't fully trust him. And why is that? Is it because we've been trained to never fully trust a bad guy? Or is it because the film has shown us he's a proficient liar with his family? As a viewer, I felt off balance, and it's because I don't have all the information I want. Now, not knowing everything about the big bad is normal. What makes this different is Raymond showing and telling us his perspective. He says himself he's a sociopath. He literally diagnoses himself. We never see any guilt because he doesn't have any. At first, I thought the film was humanizing Raymond by showing us his daily life, seeing him interact with his family. He's clearly affectionate with them. Whether it's a mask or not, that's up to you. But to me, his lack of any guilt means he cannot be humanized. He explains the abduction and killing by likening it to a science experiment. Another unexpected factor was this movie has funny moments and I was surprised. Raymond explains to Rex about the time he heroically jumped off a bridge and saved a little kid. Wow. <laughs> Rex rolls his eyes. He's almost tired of hearing Raymond talk. On the drive, Raymond tells Rex about a foiled attempt to abduct a woman. Where is your trailer? You don't mind uh, walking there? Uh, why do you not step in uh, my car? You've got this jaunty music and... To which it on the trailer. I cannot do it alone. What do you want for my wife? Uh, I need help. I cannot do it alone. Yeah, you need help here. On the surface, you would expect their drive to be really tense and suspenseful, and it is. But there's also moments of humor which elevate the movie. It's not just one thing. I'm going to make a big blanket statement here. I think Europeans tend to be really good at leaving things unsaid, vague, up to interpretation. I felt that strongly when I saw Another Round, the Danish movie in 2020. If you're not familiar with the film, the basic plot is that these men are doing an experiment where they keep their blood alcohol level above 0.05 during the day. All this stuff happens, <laughs> and then at the end, they basically take the experiment too far. Someone may or may not die. As an American, I expected, okay, they're going to come to their senses. They're going to have to quit drinking. They'll probably all be sober but it doesn't go like that. The ending, even the tone of the ending was the complete opposite of what I thought would happen. With Sporloose, you don't know if Raymond has killed before or will kill again. I saw a post on Reddit that said he won't kill again because killing Saskia was an experiment for him. He only killed Rex because he had to, but now the experiment is over. And that commenter said, that's the scariest part. He'll never be caught because he won't kill again. So this movie leaves us with a lot of questions. It's not a neat and easy movie to swallow and understand. It really makes you think about the psychology of these characters. Saskia. 
cinematography. The cinematography is brilliant. I want to talk about a couple moments. So Rex is at the rest stop after Saskia has gone missing. It goes from day to night. Rex is frantic and that feeling has increased. The owner of the rest stop tells him just wait until the morning to call the cops. She probably just walked off. So we have this here. Rex sitting in his car smoking a cigarette. He had left a note for Saskia on the windshield when he couldn't find her. And it basically said, I don't know where you are. Just stay by the car and we'll meet back here. So you see that note on the windshield. Then there's this beautiful wide shot. There are no other parked cars. It's late at night. We hear the cars on the freeway, which signals that Saskia is long gone and probably far away by now. The inside of Rex's car is lit up. We see him put his head back on the headrest and groan. There is such a feeling of dread and defeat. We recognize the uncomfortableness of waiting and not knowing. These feelings will haunt Rex until the end. Another standout moment that's related to cinematography, but also editing, is at an hour and 35. And remember, the runtime of this movie is an hour 49. We finally see the moment Raymond drugs and takes Saskia. There's hesitation. She sees a family photo. She gets in the car. We have a medium close-up or, or close-up, and it's an over-the-shoulder. You see Raymond in frame. It's one shot. Saskia cannot escape, and we cannot escape. It's brutal because we see her fight. She doesn't go easily. They don't rack focus to Raymond right away. We have several beats of Saskia in focus as she slumped over. And even though we know that she doesn't get away, we want so desperately for another unexpected moment to occur, for her to be able to get away from this guy. Sound design. I think sound design often goes overlooked in movies, but I did want to talk about this scene here. The same scene that I just talked about. <laughs> the sound design in this moment, what we hear, we hear the rattling of the tiles that Raymond's wife bought him for his birthday. She explicitly stated like these are for the summer house or the cabin, which is the house that we know he goes to to do these terrible things. Saskia only gets in the car because Raymond uses his daughter's gift, the keychain, as a reason to motivate her to get in the car. She wants to buy one for Rex, so Raymond pretends he sells keychains and he has a box of them, when really that box is the box of tiles. So you hear the rattling of the tiles, but Saskia thinks it's the rattling of the keychains. These two gifts from his family have been transformed from wholesome and thoughtful to be used as accomplices. The box of tiles are rattling throughout this scene, almost as a reminder of Rex's role as a patriarch, as the head of household. As someone whose family loves him and buys him nice thought out birthday presents. Themes. themes. The themes I identified were guilt, powerlessness, fate. Saskia's initial escape was because she sneezed. <laughs> Rex has such guilt that it kills him. There's something to be said about a man holding so much guilt that he purposely walks into his demise. I'm not saying he should have or even could have just gotten over Saskia's disappearance, but had he gotten away from Raymond and turned him in, would that not have been justice? Would that not have been better? Is there a connection between ego and guilt? The powerlessness that Rex feels, it goes against an old school idea of masculinity. A man should be in control, can protect his woman no matter what. When the reality is, Rex had no power and there was nothing he could have done. Saskia wasn't abducted that night when he left her in his car on the side of the road in the middle of the night. There was nothing to be done, no safeguarding that could have helped her escape Raymond. And that's because of fate or what Raymond calls killing Saskia 
destiny. Fate means inevitability. And destiny suggests a sense of purpose or direction that can be influenced by personal agency or something else. For Raymond, Saskia's abduction was destiny. He had control in that situation. It didn't go exactly as planned, but in the end, he satisfied his goal. For Saskia and Rex, it was fate. There wasn't anything they could do to avoid Raymond's plan. The realization that we cannot stop bad things from happening is why this movie is so haunting. Soms fantaseer ik dat ze nog leeft. Ergens ver weg, ze is heel gelukkig en zo. En dan moet ik kiezen. Of ik kan haar zo door laten leven. Maar dan kom ik niks te weten. Of als ik haar laat doodgaan, kom ik alles te weten. And then let her die. Conclusion. Conclusion. This quote is from Roger Ebert's review in 1991. One of the most intriguing things about The Vanishing is the film's unusual structure, which builds suspense even while it seems to be telling us almost everything we want to know. Having the killer show and tell us why he did things could negate suspense, but the reason it doesn't is because as the story unfolds, it doesn't feel particularly restrained. As Ebert noted, seems is the operative word. It seems to be telling us almost everything we want to know. Back to answering my thesis. I found this movie so effective because it is restrained and unexpected with how the story unfolds. As the movie progresses, we learn more and more layers of information how much time and effort Raymond has put into his twisted experiment, how methodical he is, what his approach is to this horrible crime. At eight minutes in, we essentially know that Raymond is the one that took Saskia. Perhaps there's a question on if Saskia is alive or dead. I personally didn't think so, but as a viewer, you could wonder if maybe she got away. We do want to know the motive of why Raymond did this. Typically, in a movie like this, you would assume that the driving question would be, who? Who took Saskia? But that is answered basically within the first eight minutes. We see Raymond, we understand that he's the one that took Saskia. So if it's not the who, maybe the why is what's going to drive this movie. What is his motive for doing this? But I think by the end of the movie, we realize the why doesn't really matter because it doesn't change what happened to Saskia. Qu'est-ce que vous lui avez fait? Je vais vous le raconter, je vous l'ai promis. Mais la seule façon de vous le raconter, c'est de vous faire vivre exactement ce qu'elle a vécu. Vous êtes complètement fou. Peu importe. So what I think I find the most interesting about this movie is the question that did Rex's pride and ego and guilt result in his death? Was his death worth finding out the answer to what happened to Saskia? I don't know. I don't have the answer. I think it's it's up to you and what you think. But that's what makes a truly powerful movie in my opinion is it it makes you think it makes you question it makes you think about what you would do in that situation i would highly recommend watching spore loose because once again it really knocked my socks off